Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So here I'm holding a bill, a type of pole weapon, pole arm, popular in the 15th and 16th centuries in medieval and Renaissance Europe. Now, I received a really good question from Dr. Young, um, who's an author. I've stuck a link below to his website. Thanks for your question, Damon. I've answered it by email, um, but I thought this warranted a video because it's an interesting enough topic. So Damon's question was, where do pole arms balance? How do they balance? Where are their balance points or center of gravities? Now, <laughs> this is actually, uh, it is both an easy and a complicated uh, question to answer but I'm going to try and do it as concisely as possible. First of all you have to say it depends on the particular pole arm. Okay so I've got a just as a representative uh, example I've got a Roman pilum behind me. I've got a medieval bill here. Obviously you know I have access to spears and um, Dane axes and various other types of pole arm and quite simply um, what I said to Dame was well, if you start off with a wooden shaft so if you imagine this doesn't have the uh, bill head on the end of it if you've got a wooden shaft um, that is of uniform width all the way along, assuming it's not tapered. And I just want to, in brackets there, point out that lots of polearm shafts were tapered. Um, so we know from uh, the Mary Rose, for example, from 1545, where lots of um, shafts for bills survive, that a lot of them were thicker at the hitting end than at the bottom end. So in literal terms, not all polearm shafts are going to be the same thickness all the way along. They might be barreled, they might be thicker at one end than the other, but let's assume it's the same width all the way along, then obviously that pole is going to balance in the middle. But does this uh, bill balance in the middle? Well, no, obviously not. It balances at the heavy end. And so really what you've got to do if you're trying to imagine where a pole arm balances and whether you're an author or maybe you do uh, role playing games or what you're a games designer, video game designer or whatever, when you think about how that um, pole weapon balances, and this does have a, a lot of relevance for a lot of video games, Bannerlord that I've been playing recently, where they, in my view, seem to have got the balance points and the inertia and the movement of the weapons completely wrong in some cases. When you're trying to imagine how a weapon might move and handle and what sort of inertia it, it takes, uh, how much energy it takes to get it started moving, how much energy it takes to stop it from moving, if, if you drop it, how it might um, fall off a, you know, a shelf or a hook or anything else, um, or even just how it feels in the hand, the point of balance for this bill, for example, is there. So you can see the middle of the shaft is around there, and you can actually see that we're now about a quarter from the end. So this is sort of an extreme example. Bills and halberds are probably some of the, as well as things like Dane axes and other types of axes like that, are some of the most unbalanced, should we say, although I don't really like that term because they're balanced for what they're intended to do, that is to hit and chop. Um, but they are the most top heavy, should we say, uh, weapons out there. Okay, so any weapon which has a large amount of metal at one end and then a wooden shaft is going to be balanced quite near to that end. And what are the ramifications of that? Well, the ramifications of that are quite simply that if I want to hold this at the back end and swing it, uh, it takes a certain amount of energy and inertia to um, get that thing moving, and it takes a little bit longer time to accelerate that tip to full speed. But once I get up to maximum velocity, once I've accelerated it to its sort of terminal velocity, as it were, it's got a lot of energy at that point and anything it hits is going to um, receive a lot of energy at the hitting end. So it's going to be very, very potent at hitting, but not the quickest thing to swing. And that's not only don't think about just initial swings, that is subsequent follow up swings as well. So if I hit bam and hit something really, really hard, maybe fell that person or don't fell them, depends whether they're wearing armor and where I hit them. Um, and then I want to recharge that weapon again to hit again. It takes a fair amount of energy to do that. If we just swap over to a sword, for a second. So even though this is a large two-handed sword, this is the windless uh, English two-hander which I've reviewed before on the channel, the balance point is completely different and it's the opposite on a sword. So swords balance nearer to the hilt end because of the hilt basically, because of the pommel and the guard and the fact that you've got taper, distal taper and profile taper in the blade. So this for example not only is it quicker to move forwards, but it's quicker to reload and it's quicker to redirect somewhere as well. It takes less energy to do that. But not all pole weapons were built uh, equal. So as I said, the bill or the halberd is the extreme example really of where you've got a lot of mass at the hitting end. 
Weapons where you've also got mass at the hitting end, but less so than this, would be things like a glaive or a partisan in general. It depends on the design. Some partisans and glaives have very big, heavy heads. Some builds and halberds are actually quite light. So obviously, again, it depends on the particular pole weapon. But generally speaking, these sorts of weapons have most of their mass concentrated towards the end. So the balance point will be about a quarter or a third from the hitting end, from the pointy end, okay? Um, now, obviously some other pole arms are very different to that. Um, spears, which have maybe a very light head. So if you just imagine a long wooden shaft, and it's only got a very small spearhead at the end, that's only gonna change the balance point minimally. So you might find that the balance point is not so far from the middle of the total length of the object, okay? In this case, this is a pilum, and a pilum actually has a large amount of steel at one end. So you'll notice that whilst I'm, my hand or the balance point is not that close to the pointy end, it is uh, not that far from the middle. It is nevertheless closer to the pointy end because the mass of this half is only very slightly more than the mass of that half. Um, but a, uh, a lighter type of uh, javelin, for example, or javelin that you use in Olympic uh, throwing, the balance point is much nearer to the middle. Something like a pike, the balance point will be quite near the middle. In fact, we do find pikes sometimes tapered. So sometimes so that you can uh, manage a longer pole in order to keep cavalry and other infantry at bay further away. Uh, if you're talking about maybe an 18, 16, 20 foot long pole, you might taper it so that you can have extra reach at the cost of a bit of uh, mass and strength and rigidity at the point. Um, and therefore you might find that the point of balance might actually be slightly towards the back uh, from the center, but it won't be very far towards the back because ultimately you're talking about a long stick with a relatively small head of uh, steel at the end. Um, so obviously pole arms, you've got to look at the, think about a, just a bare pole, the balance point's gonna be in the middle, and then look at what mass do you have at one end, what mass do you have at the other end, and you can kind of visually or mentally adjust where that balance point is gonna be based on that. One final uh, kind of, not exception to the rule, but a complication to the rule that I want to point out are pole axes. Now, uh, what I will mention, I don't have a nice pole axe in my collection. If you are a pole axe maker, or if you know a good pole axe maker who you can contact, get in contact with me, because I am in the market for a, a good, perhaps even a couple of good um, pole axes for a number of videos I'm planning, uh, but just generally to feature on the channel as well. So I'm interested in pole axes, but, um, pole axes are somewhat different because they are uh, quite complicated pole arms. Not only do you have a hitting head with maybe an axe and a hammer or a spike and an axe and a pointy um, point at the end. So you've got mass at the hitting end, just like with a uh, bill or a halberd. But in addition to that, you often also have a spike or a shoe at the back end as well, which obviously brings the balance back a bit, a bit like the pommel on a sword. But in addition to that, you often have very long langettes on the shaft, uh, sometimes completely encasing most of the shaft or, or one half of the shaft. And very often as well, you have one or even two rondel disc guards. Um, so a pole axe, uh, predicting where a pole axe is gonna balance is actually quite difficult. And uh, funnily enough, I always find that pole axes in the hand are quite surprising. They don't feel like a bill or a halberd. They feel not like a sword either. They, they, they kind of feel just like a pole axe. It's very difficult to know what to compare them to. And of all the weapons that I handle uh, in my day-to-day -day business, I would say the thing that they actually feel the most similar to, funnily enough, are the rifle with a bayonet attached. So the musket or the rifle with a bayonet has mass all along it. So it's quite a heavy object, um, but spread over a sort of man-sized length. And that's somewhat similar to the pole axe actually. So the pole axe doesn't feel hugely different to a rifle with a bayonet on, but the pole axe does feel very different to a bill or a halberd or a spear or a sword or pretty much any other weapons of its own uh, period. Right, so I'm just going to finish up by saying thank you uh, very much again to Damon for that really interesting question. I hope that the answer to it has been interesting for the viewers here. I am open to questions. Um, obviously, I receive quite a lot of emails and quite a lot of questions uh, through the Facebook page and through um, my channel Gmail address as well. And I can't answer them all, I'm afraid. I just don't have time. I try to answer most questions that I can on uh, Patreon. So I've got, I do extra videos on Patreon, three extra videos a month on Patreon. Um, 
and I do try to answer all questions on Patreon um, within the best of my abilities anyway. Um, so, and the other thing is, if you do send me a question, and I do scan through most of them, even if I can't answer uh, most of them, um, if it's a particularly good question like Damon's, and if it's something that I think will make a good video, then it might get featured. Uh, so thank you again to Dr. Damon Young for asking me that question. I hope the answer's been interesting. Link to his website below. If you send me a good question, uh, maybe here in the comments underneath this video or by email, um, or if you're on Patreon, send me a message through Patreon. If it's something I think will make a good video, you may well get a, a shout out and a video made out of it. Um, so thanks for watching. See you again soon. Give us a like and a subscribe, share this video around, and I'll see you again soon. Cheers, folks.